technical issues, got it solved. Thank you for your patience. And as always, there's my, my number and text. If you ever need to call or text me, you can let me know. And then the third song is the offertory song. So uh, Boo will have you sit down, and so Bob and David will come down the aisle, and if you want to just, you know, hold your deposit, your, deposit, your offering up, <laughs> then, uh, then uh, and they will, they, it will come to you. Otherwise, they'll just kind of look to see if there's anybody with their offering. And then, uh, but it'll be on the third song, so you can sit down during that song. Just some quick updates. Uh, Dwight had his knee surgery, um, was successful the very next day. That morning, he popped his tendon on the same leg. It was just worn out, and so he had to have emergency uh, tendon surgery, so they got that fixed, and uh, so he's doing fine. He's in a lot of pain. It's going to be a slow recovery, but, you know, he's doing well. Both surgeries were very successful. Jean got out of Encompass. She did very well, so thankful for that. She's starting to lose a little weight. And Linda, who, who had knee replacement a couple, three, four weeks ago, she's doing remarkably well. So she's doing well. So we want to praise God for those uh, 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 situations in our church. So uh, is there anything else we need to know before we pray? All right, let's go to our Father in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this time, Lord. I ask, Lord, that every heart would be open this morning, that our minds would be prepared. Lord, I just pray we leave our burdens outside and just for the next hour worship you for being the good, gracious, loving Father that you are. We ask that you bless our time together, help us to enjoy worship and singing to you, but also, Lord, may the words of your Holy Scripture fall on our hearts, Lord, and grow abundantly in us so that we walk out these doors a changed individual on fire for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I pray, pray all this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen and amen. All right, let's start our services off as we all stand and sing. First song will be Sweet, Sweet Spirit. Next song, Holy, Holy, Holy.
Thank you. you. may be seated. This will be our offertory hymn, which is Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. What a fellowship, what a joy. Safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. And our last hymn today will be O oh, Worship the King. And let's try it seated today. Let's try it seated today. O oh, Worship the King. All glorious above and gratefully sing his power and his love, our shield and defender, the ancient of day, pavilion in splendor and girded with praise. 
Amen. Thank you, worship team. So we're going to continue in the book of Acts. We're going to finish up Exodus. I said the book of Acts. I'm thinking Wednesday. Sorry. In the book of Exodus. So we're going to finish up chapter 4. So just uh, starting in verse 18, we'll go to the end, which is 31. So real quick overview, you know, God was a, God's a burning bush and was not consuming. I say burning bush that wasn't being consumed. You know, God told Moses, hey, I want you to do this. Moses kept on and kept on giving him excuse after excuse after excuse of why he couldn't be the chosen one of God. He gave him five excuses and then basically Moses said, look, I don't want to do it. Get somebody else. <laughs> so God was angered by that, but Moses relented. And so, you know, he will, he will go, ask to go. Uh, I mean, so this morning we're going to look as he goes back to his father-in-law Jethro and then loads up the family on their Ford donkey and, uh, and is going to head back to Egypt. So uh, that's what's going to happen here. So uh, without further ado, it's got a good message today. Now, you need to have your pencils and pens out, okay? I want you to take some good notes. I want you to take some good notes because it's going to be really deep. I know sometimes we get a little scared about doctrine and theology, but we're going to get a little deep. We're gonna, we're gonna, we've been in the shallow end. We're going to wade into the deep end a little bit, okay? It's, I'm not going too deep, but you may get, you, you may get your nose covered, okay? We've got to get in a little bit. So with all that said, uh, if you're willing and able to please stand for the ring of God's word, the grass wither, the flower fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. Whoops, went the wrong way. Sorry. So Exodus 4, beginning at verse 18. And Moses went and returned to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said unto him, Let me go, I pray thee, and return unto my brethren which are in Egypt, and see whether yet see whether they be yet alive. And Jethro said to Moses, Go in peace. And the Lord said unto Moses and Midian, Go, return unto Egypt, for all the men that are dead would salt thy life. So it's been forty years. And Moses took his wife and his sons, he has two sons, and set them upon an ass, and he returned to the land of Egypt. And Moses took the rod of God in his hand, and the Lord said unto Moses, When thou goest to return into Egypt, see that thou do all those wondrous the wonders before Pharaoh. Remember, God showed him the trick with the rod and turning it into a snake and taking the river out of the Nile or the water out and he'll turn to blood. And do all the wonders before Pharaoh, which I have put in thy hand, but I will harden his heart, Pharaoh's that he shall not let the people go. And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my son. The very first time in the Bible that the nation of, uh, of Jews, Israel, the Hebrews, have been referred to as God's son. So uh, just, just to take note of, even my firstborn. And I say unto thee, Let my son go, that he may serve me, and if thou refuse to let him go, behold, I will slay thy son, even thy firstborn. Remember, remember, remember the tenth plague um, in 24. And it came to pass, by the way, in the end, that the Lord met him and sought to kill him. Now he's talking about Moses. It's a very odd scripture, but that's what God's, God's upset at Moses about something, and we'll talk about that. Then Zipporah, his wife, took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of her son and cast it at his feet, which is Moses, and said, Surely a bloody husband art thou to me. So he let him go. So God relented. Then she said, A bloody husband thou art because of the circumcision. Uh-oh. And verse 27, And the Lord said to Aaron, Aaron his, his brother, Go into the wilderness to meet Moses. And he went and met him in the, mount, in the mount of God and kissed him. They're happy to see each other. And Moses told Aaron all the words of the Lord had sent, to him, had sent him and all the signs which he had commanded him. 
And Moses and Aaron went and gathered together all the elders of the children of Israel, so they're back in Egypt, and Aaron spake all the words which the Lord had spoken unto Moses and did the signs in sight of the people. So he's showing only the, 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 the Israel, the, the Jews, and the people believed, and when they heard that the Lord had visited the children of Israel and that he had looked upon their affliction, then they bowed their heads and worshipped. This is God's word for God's people. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the inerrant, infallible word of God. Lord, we just ask that as we open it this morning, that the words will fall upon our heart, and that, Lord, those words would grow abundantly in our heart, Lord, and cause us to change so that we walk out these doors on fire for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I pray all this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen and amen. You may be seated. So we're going to look at three points. The first two I want to really spend some time on. So the third one we'll get through very quickly. Um, but the first two I really do want to spend time on. So I have broken up our, our, the, the latter part of chapter 4. Moses was relenting to the sovereignty of God. He was revealing disobedience. And we'll get to that when we, about circumcision. And then a reunion of worship. So when Moses and Aaron get back to Egypt, they will worship God because everybody is, is thankful that God will take them out uh, of Egypt. So first looking at that one, relenting to a sovereign God. So what does relenting to a sovereign God mean? Moses had, had tried to tell God, made excuses, God, I can't, God, I won't, you know, I can't. But God kept saying, hey, I, it, did I not make your mouth and you're worried about not being a good orator? I made your mouth. So I, I can make you say and make it sound very good. But Moses did relent to God and goes back to Egypt to confront Pharaoh. So once we see that Moses was in, he was in. He never looked back. He was always in. So now he's in, and he's in 100%. So we talked about the five excuses that he had beforehand. And if you'll remember in Exodus 4, 13 and 14a, and he said, O oh my Lord, sin, sin pray thee by the hand of whom I thou sin. And that's a difficult King James translation, but it basically all other translations read, send somebody else, not me, send somebody else. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. As we talked about earlier, Moses kept giving excuses God kept answering every single excuse till finally Moses just said, look, send somebody else. God became angry. So what Moses did and what we read this morning, so Moses went to his father-in-law, so that's a respectful thing to do. That's honoring your mother and father. So he went to his father-in-law. He loaded up the kids and the wife, and then he went to Egypt. And then we get to verse 21. 21 is a weird it challenges scholars everywhere. No one has a right answer for this. Verse 21 says, And the Lord said unto Moses, When thou goest to return to Egypt, see that thou do all these wonders before Pharaoh, which I have put in thine hand. Now, comma there, exclamation, uh, semicolon, colon, but I will harden his heart that he shall not let the people go. So God's telling Moses, do all these signs, but Pharaoh, I'm going to make sure his heart is hardened. So he's not going to let you go. So a lot of people have a lot of issues with that. So we, we, we really, you know, juxtapose that, the sovereign God, to our free will. So can God's sovereignty override our free will? So we're going to talk about that. So uh, <clears throat> I want to just say a few things real quick. God will never, ever turn away someone who wants to come to him. So keep that in mind. Nobody has a, even a, a, just a small flicker of desire to want Jesus Christ and God say, no, you can't have them. Uh-uh, get away. God will never, ever turn away someone who wants to come to Jesus. So you've got to know that, okay? So as we progress, 
Make sure you keep that in mind. God will never, ever turn the heart of someone who's trying to seek Jesus Christ away from him. He will not do it. So I want to give you scriptures to support that. John 6 and 36. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will no wise cast out. So Jesus Christ himself said it. If you're wanting to come to Jesus, he, he's got open arms. Matthew 11 and verse 28. Come unto me, all ye are labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your soul. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You all know that verse. We all know that verse. So again, Christ will never turn somebody away. And there's many, many more I could read. I want to read one more. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So keep that in mind. So keep that in mind. God will never, ever turn away anyone who has any desire in their heart to come to Jesus Christ. He never, ever will. So why does God have to harden his heart? I mean, that's really a question that theologians have really been debating for centuries and centuries and centuries. Now, I'm going to go ahead and give you the answer. I'm going to give you the answer because it should be blatantly obvious, obvious for God's glory. Every single thing that happens to me and you should be to God's glory. And you say, oh, well, preacher, I mean, there's a lot of travesty that happens in my life. It should be ultimately for God's glory. It should ultimately be for God's glory. So keep that in mind, too. That's very important. So Paul says in Romans, and this, this really answers it for us about the sovereignty issue of, of God. The sovereignty issue of God. So this is, this is what I want to read to you. Romans 9, beginning at verse 14. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. For he has said to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. God will choose whom he gives mercy and whom he gives compassion. He will choose mercy. Who will get those things? Verse 16. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, For even even for this same purpose have I raised up thee, Pharaoh, that I might show my power in thee, that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore, Hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy and whom he will harden. So that is God saying, hey, if I want to harden Pharaoh's heart for my glory, that is my prerogative. I have every single right as God. I created Pharaoh. God created each one of us. Each one of us. As much as I love my children, I am the caregiver. Mom and I are the caregivers to our children. But they're God's children far more than their mom and I's children. So, and we can't forget that. Now, we love them to death, literally to death, but they're God's children first. And he will use them for his glory. Isaiah 43, even everyone that is called by my name, for I have created him for my glory. I have formed thee, ye, yet I have made him. Romans 11. For of him and through him and to him for all are all things to whom be glory forever. So if you ever struggle about what God's will is for your life, it's to glorify him. I, I mean, and I'm not trying to be, you know, simplistic, but your decision needs to be looking towards Jesus Christ. Is this going to glorify God on what I'm doing? And then lastly, 1 Corinthians 10 says, Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all for the glory of God. Even eating. And I give God praise when I eat a lot of times because I'm thinking, Lord, this is the best meal. And I get to stare at a beautiful sky 
and, 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 you know, God didn't have to give us taste buds. We could be like cows just eating grass, is eating grass. But God be the glory. When you cut that medium rare T-bone steak with that hot butter and sour cream baked potato beside it, praise God. Can I get a witness? Amen. Come on. That, I mean, literally, you better be thanking God. Thank, thank your spouse if they made it. Give them some, you know, you want to honor your spouse. But praise be to God. You could be a cow out there eating grass. Cow doesn't care what the, the, the briars he runs into. Briars get eaten. Makes no difference to him. So, the question is, does Pharaoh have total free will to do what he wants, or is God's sovereign will always done? Now, this is, this is the problem that has faced theologians for centuries. And if you're sitting there going, what problem? There's a problem. And whether you know it or not, you are on the side. Is it man's free will that determines his life, or God's sovereign will that determines his life? So I'm just going to try to help you because I battled this for years. And I, di- I mean, I dove way deep. I mean, we're talking about getting the scuba tanks. I went way deep on this issue. It was a huge issue for me, so I dove deep on it. So I'm going to show you a quick video. As you watch this video, you're going to be thinking, why in the world is he showing us this video? I promise, well, I can't promise. I hope it'll make sense once you see the video and I can explain it, okay? It's a YouTube video. Now, let me just say first, these are the Baptists that, that like to have a little wine with their drink. So, you know, that for us who do not like to see any alcoholic beverage at dinner, like myself, just give me some grace. Just don't, just don't. Plus, it's apple juice. I called the producer and he said it's apple juice in those wine glasses. So just enjoy it for what it is, and try, let's try not to be critical. Just enjoy it for what it is. Okay, here we go. We're going to try this out. <laughs> Notice the cat is at the head of the table, all dogs. Mistletoe. So, believe it or not, that is, that's a very popular video on YouTube. <laughs> so, 15 million plus views. Probably 20 of those are mine because I think it's so funny. And why is that funny? Because it's weird. Because why? Dogs don't eat at tables, do they? So, when we see them acting like humans... Those dogs don't have a clue what's going on. They've just been trained to do those things, but it's funny. They can't pick up utensils. They can't drink from a glass. 
they, they eat food a certain way in a bowl on the ground or out in the woods somewhere, right? Because it's their nature. That's the nature of a dog is to eat food standing on all fours with, 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 with their mouth, no utensils. That's God's nature. But when they dress up like human beings, that's some parody and some fun in that. So just I, so let me go with, God, with nature. An, let's use animals because they're a great example. So let's say, let's say Bill. Bill, I'm going to pick on you if you don't mind. Bill is going to fight a silverback gorilla. <laughs> and that's right, Bill. I, 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 have, I have faith in you. I got money on you, Bill. Okay, and let's give Bill a little chance. Let's rewind the clock 50 years. No offense, Bill. You know, you couldn't take that walker into the ring. So let's rewind it 50 years to, to Bill's prime. And let's, let's put him in a boxing ring. How would Bill do fighting a silverback gorilla? It wouldn't. It, now, now, Boo, uh, you're right. You know a silverback gorilla can on one hit, not even full force, one hit, kill a man instantly. They have power beyond belief. So if, if Bill stepped into the ring a hundred times, how many times could he defeat that silverback gorilla? Zero. And I love you, Bill, but zero. Why? Because God gave Bill a nature, and he gave a silverback gorilla a nature. They are strong, ferocious animals, deadly and dangerous. Deadly and dangerous. So they have a different nature than us. You see my point? Now, just, just bear with me. Let's take a man and an eagle. Bill, again, I'm going to use you going back to your youth. I got 35-year-old Bill. We walk outside the church and stand in the side parking lot, and I've got a bald eagle and Bill. And I say the first one to the peak of the roof gets $100. And we do that 100 times. How many times could Bill beat that eagle to the top of the roof. <laughs> That's right, zero. Zero, how come? Because the, na the nature of the eagle is he can fly. I don't care how strong Bill's will is, he can never fly. Now I must, take a, I must go down a rabbit trail. When I was four years old, I thought I could fly. I'm serious, I'd run in my backyard and I thought I was getting enough air. I thought, man, I, I'm almost there. I'm almost there. I did. That's, I thought, I could, well, never mind. But I, I was four. I promise I was four. But, you know, I, someone should have come out there and said, look, um, boy, you, you ain't going to fly. You ain't going to fly. One more, one more, just to prove my point. I need to stay by the mic. So a man and a dolphin. And, again, Bill, I'm picking on you. Bill's prime. We go down to Florida, and I say, Bill, you're going to race this floor, this uh, dolphin all the way to Texas. You've got to swim from Florida to Texas, the Gulf of Mexico, and they do that race a hundred times. How many times could Bill beat that dolphin? As you are, Bill, zero. Why? Because the nature of the dolphin is he's, he's, he's a fast swimmer. I think they can reach speeds of 35, 40 miles an hour in, in the water and maintain that for a while. There's just no way because God made dolphins different. So when I say your na our nature's different, you understand what I mean, don't you? The nature of animals, they each have their own nature that God gave them. So every one of those animals I mentioned has a free will. A gorilla can decide to do whatever he wants during the day, and he has to do it, but he must contain himself inside the nature God gave him. The gorilla, like Bill, cannot fly. The gorilla, like Bill, cannot swim. God gave him a nature too. So one, one, one more example. If I took a very hungry lion and caged him up and brought him into a huge room and had a big bowl of salad right here 
And then over here I had a big bowl. I had a, I had a lamb tied to a rope that couldn't move. And I opened that cage and I let that lion out who hasn't eaten in a week. How many times is he going to run and devour the little lamb? A hundred times. He is free to choose the salad, isn't he? But will he ever choose the salad? No. Because God gave him a nature as well. So he is always going to go for the meat. He's going to go for the meat. So you're saying, preacher, what in the world is your point? (laughs) So my point is, with that frame of reference, he gives each one of us a nature too. And I've told you all this before, how many of you chose, you looked at all your choices, you could be African, Asian, Middle Eastern, Russian, European, Eskimo, but you chose Caucasian. Who here chose Caucasian? Looking at all these white people and nobody chose Caucasian? That's right. God, God decided what your... So... You have free will inside your nature. You can't choose your your race. Well, your nationality. I believe in one race, the human race. Okay, how many of y'all looked at your genders, male and female, and said, you know what, definitely? Anybody? Show of hands? No? Hmm? But you have free will, don't you? Okay. Yeah, you have free will. But you can't choose your gender. Can't choose what year you'd be born. Can't choose your parents. Do, do, do you see what I'm saying? Anybody getting clue? Let me put my glasses on. <laughs> Anybody understand what's going on? Yes, you have free will, but it's inside God's nature. So whatever nature he's given you. Remember I've told you, my favorite sport is basketball. I went out for basketball, and it was a hot mess. I mean, the coach was like, are you kidding me? I was so bad. I I couldn't understand why God gave me a desire to be a basketball player. I mean, I had a real desire to be a basketball player. But I was horrible, horrible. And I couldn't play it. So, yes, we have free will. Don't fall asleep. Don't fall asleep. But it's contained inside of the nature God gave you. If my wife and I were on a deserted island and all we had to eat was Mexican food, it it would be heaven for me. Oh, Oh, I'd probably gain so much weight. It would be heck for my wife. She would be skin and bones. They would finally come to rescue us and say, what happened here? i say, "Woo, my nature, I love Mexican food. My wife hates it. So, so my wife has free meal, a uh, free will. Yes, she will eventually eat the Mexican food or die. She doesn't have a choice. But you understand, your free will is, is limited to what God gave you by your nature. You, you understand that. Amen. Amen, Bill. I'm right there with you. So you will hear me say often, the sovereignty of God. Does man have free will? Yes, the Bible's clear on that. The Bible is clear that man has free will. But I just want you all to keep in mind that your will is limited to your nature. You understand that? So when you answer the free will sovereignty issue, make sure you fully understand it. Because the Bible says we were predestined, Ephesians 1, we were predestined and chosen before the foundations of the world, Romans 8. And the way that was described to be my my preacher God looked down the corridor of time and saw what you would do. Well, who does that make God? If God looks down the corridor of time to see what you would do, is he sitting there going, oh, choose me, choose me. Oh, Peter, oh, he chose me, great. 
I predestined Peter to be saved before the foundation of the world. No, that makes me God. That makes me God. That means God is powerless. So I'm going to let y'all digest that. It, Pharaoh's heart is hardened 20 times in Exodus. As we go through Exodus, all the way up to Exodus 14, God hardens it half the time, and Pharaoh hardens his own heart half the time. So we'll touch on this more. We'll touch on this more as we go through and see all those hardened hearts. But if anybody wants to talk about it more and say, you know what, I've never really thought about this preacher. I've just, this is kind of neat. Let me, let's talk this through. I'd love to talk to you. I'd love to talk to you about it. And you may have a different opinion than me. And I, I'm okay with that. J just be able to back it up with Scripture. D don't tell me what your grandpa's preacher preached to them. So, I mean, that's great. But I'm always going to go with the Word of God. So as long as you've got Scripture to back up your free will or sovereignty. But obviously I lean towards the sovereignty end of that. God is sovereign. And, 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 and read Romans 9 as well. Romans 9 is clear who God chose. Esau I hated and Jacob I loved before they were even born. Romans 9. Before they were even born and able to do something, God chose who, we, who we'd love and who we'd hate. So, that's, again, a t I want to just leave that out there. Y'all ponder it, think about it, meditate on it, and uh, give me a call if you want to talk about it. I don't want to fight, but if you, if you sincerely want to talk, I would love to talk about the issue with you. But love, I'll, take you I'll pay for your Mexican lunch. has to be Mexican, okay? has to be Mexican. <laughs> So, but, and we can talk about it. I love talking about it. It is, it is a great and awesome topic. But it is, it is the debate of all debates on theologians. They really debate this issue, and people are very firm in what they believe. So, you know, I don't mind you believe what you believe, just have Scripture to back it up. That's my only point. So, now, secondly, another, this is another deep topic, but we'll be quick. We've got to be real quick. So, Revealing disobedience. So it says in Exodus 4, 24 through 26, that God, God wanted to kill him. So all of a sudden, God's demeanor changes from Pharaoh to Moses. And God is wanting to kill Moses because of the circumcision of his son. So there, there are not a lot of commandments there are a lot, not a lot of commandments in, in, in the Old Testament for Genesis and the first three chapters of Exodus. There's only a few, but God made it abundantly clear that circumcision is a requirement of all Jews. Circumcision is a requirement, so I'm going to fast forward to, through some of these. So Genesis 17, as for me, this is God talking to Abraham. As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee. Thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee. And I will make thee exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of thee. And kings shall come out of thee, and I will establish my covenant between me and thee, Abraham, and thy seed. And after this, their generation for an everlasting covenant to be a God un unto thee and to thy seed. So he keeps saying, Abraham's seed, Abraham's seed. And I will give thee and thy seed after thee and the land. And skip down to nine. And God said unto Abraham, thou shalt keep my covenant therefore Thy and thy seed after thee in their generation. This is my covenant, which I shall keep between me and you and thy seed. And he says it one last time in Genesis 17, 11. God is trying to make it clear. Abraham's seed, Abraham's generation. Abraham is a nation of people. So let me ask you, why was circumcision the covenant, the symbol of that covenant. 
Why didn't he say just pierce your ears? Just pierce your ears, Abraham, and all your descendants, pierce their ears. Or shave your head, and all your descendants, shave your head. Now, has anybody ever thought of that? Why circumcision? It is an intimate covenant, is it not? I won't get graphic, but it's pretty intimate. A circumcision, and he was very clear, your, your children, the eighth day of their life, you circumcise the child. So have you ever thought why circumcision? Well, I, I think I read the answer to you. It all has to do with Abraham's seed, his generation. There's nothing more intimate than a man and woman having a baby, forming a baby. So Abraham's seed, literally the last thing that goes by is that covenant, that reminder of the covenant between God and Abraham. And that's why if you've been in our Acts study, we've been in Acts 15 and 16, it is a huge deal for the Jews. They, they are literally demanding, hey, you're Jesus Christ, hey, we'll take him. He's just got to be added. You've got to include circumcision. They were, called, they were called Judaizers, and they tormented Paul throughout his whole ministry because they did not want to lose that covenant the covenant of circumcision, a very intimate, I mean, it is a very intimate thing. That's why they didn't want to lose it. I mean, and one could see, yeah, that is. But Jesus Christ fulfilled the covenant. He fulfilled it when he lived a perfect life and died on the cross. So thy seed, thy generation, thy fruitfulness, so circumcision is an outward act of an inward transition. So you should know some of these uh, verses that I'm going to get to. Um, it's a heart issue. Romans 4, the righteousness of the face would had yet been uncircumcised, that's Abraham, that he might be the father of them all, that they be not circumcised, the righteous might be imputed unto them, the Gentiles. When was Abraham declared righteous? Genesis 15. 20 years, over 20 years, before Genesis 17, when Moses was 99. I'm sorry, Abraham was 99 when God came to him and said, you and I are going to form a covenant. Get your knife out. 99, okay, this is what you're going to do. You're going to cut the foreskin off. That's going to be our covenant. 99 years old, and that's going to be how we relate. So what Paul's asking is, when did he declare him righteous? In 15, 20 years before the circumcision. So it wasn't the circumcision that made him righteous. It was God. His heart had changed. Then lastly in Romans 12, but he is a Jew, which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter. So Paul's making it clear. Outward circumcision was a shadow and type, is a shadow and type of what already should be in your heart. And then Paul goes on to say, Jesus said in John 3, Jesus, okay, yeah. So that's why when Jesus was talking to Nicodemus, what did, what did Jesus say to Nicodemus? Jesus answered and said to him, remember in John 3, Nicodemus came to him at night and said, unto him, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said unto him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Nicodemus knew exactly what Jesus was saying. It's not that he didn't understand the question. He didn't understand the concept. How do you be born again? That's what Jesus is trying to say. Your heart needs to be right. What did he call the Pharisees? Hypocrites. What's a hypocrite? Someone who looks good on the outside, but inwardly 
are bones. That's what Jesus said about the Pharisees. Your decaying bones, your whitewashed tombs, looking all pretty on the outside and decay and death and rot on the inside. Circumcision was never about a physical appearance. It was about a heart issue. And the Old Testament is just a shadow and type of what was to come in Jesus Christ. So now we are baptized in the Spirit. We have a heart change. Ezekiel, Ezekiel 36, 37. We have a heart of stone. God has removed and replaced it with a heart of flesh. That is literally what circumcision is. And so our outwardly appearance is the baptism. That's the sign of your circumcised heart. Their sign of a circumcised heart was circumcision. But Abraham, 23 years prior, Genesis 15, he had a circumcised heart. God just showed it to him in a physical appearance. So it's very important. So now, yeah, this is still in John 3. Jesus answered, Verily I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom. That which is born of flesh is flesh, but that which is born of spirit is spirit. You must be born twice. Born twice, you'll die once. Born once, you'll die twice. That's, it's, it's as simple as that. You must be born twice. And everybody in this room, hopefully, has been born again. I know we probably we pass that off to Pentecostals and Charismatics, but it's really everyone. We should be born again. John 3, born again. That's the sign of a circumcised heart. And then he's talking about the reunion, and I'll be extra quick. So he's, they, they bowed their head in worship, and Exodus 4 says, and then that's, that's praise. That's praise. They praise God together. Listen, why were you born? To glorify God. What's God's will for you? To glorify God. That is ultimate. Now, he has different paths for each one of us to take, but we are all to glorify God in everything we do. Hebrews 13. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name, Romans 12, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Think of the Old, Old Testament, the temple. They always brought a sacrifice. Well, now it's you. Your, your body's a temple, so you, you, your life should be a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, which, all, which also means worship. And then John 4, but the hour cometh, and now we is, when the true worshiper shall worship, this is the, 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 the woman at the well, Jesus is talking to her, but the hour is coming now, when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, and the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and if, thy, and if they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. So, circumcision is, is, is nothing but a, what's happened in your heart. The instant you became a believer, the instant you gave your life to Jesus Christ, the instant you repented of your sin and just fell on the mercies of Jesus Christ, you became circumcised, both men and women. You became, your heart was changed. Your heart was changed, and that's just what that means. So, Boo, if you'll come up, we'll have our closing hymn. And if there is anything I can pray with you guys about, if there is anything I can talk to you about, if you want to take this opportunity and come up during the invitation song, I'll be glad to entertain. And if you don't know Jesus Christ, I'd love to talk to you about that. Our hymn of invitation today, Just As I Am, as we all stand. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. I Just as I 
Amen. So I, I shouldn't have gone through both those topics in one sermon. I thought I could do it. I really brushed the circumcision one. So if you have any questions, just call or email me. Again, I'd love to take you out. And it doesn't have to be Mexican. It can be anything you like. So, uh, you know, pray for all those who need healing in our church. The wife, Linda, we're thanking God. She's really on the, on, almost, almost fully recovered. And uh, Jean, Jean still needs your prayers. But she's doing great so far. So just... Just, just keep the church in your prayer just well. So uh, let, uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this time together, Lord. 